Amitabh Amita Babaskar is Professor of Sociology at the Institute for Economic Growth, New Delhi, an interdisciplinary sociologist, anthropologist, and geographer. Uh, Babaskar is a key figure in agrarian and environmental studies, environmental politics, urban environments, and middle class cultural politics as seen from India. She's the author or editor of multiple works, including In the Belly of the River, Tribal Conflicts Over Development in the Namada Valley, Waterlines, the, the Penguin Book of River Writings, Waterscapes, The Cultural po Politics of a Natural Resource, um, with Raka Ray, Elite and Everyman, The Cultural Politics of the Indian Middle Class, and most recently, quite a unique photo book, um, First Garden of the Republic, Nature on the President's Estate. Amita's talk is titled, Laboring to Make the Landscape of Power. Thank you so much, Sharad, for inviting me to this, what has so far been a brilliantly stimulating uh, day of talks. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you to the uh, Center for South Asian Studies for, uh, for hosting me. Um, the, uh, a question that has uh, driven a lot of my, my work is, um, how do landscapes and lives shape each other? And my previous work with small farmers and forest dwellers in the valley of the Narmada River in mm. central India, and with migrant workers and squatters in Delhi, looked at how people and nature resist powerful projects. Uh, a large dam in one case, the making of a world-class city in the other. So insights from this work informed my approach when I was invited to write, a rather different, write about a rather different landscape that of the President's estate in Delhi. And this was a place which, like no, perhaps no other in India, is permeated with privilege, a carefully curated showcasing of the power to cultivate the earth to spectacular effect. How would I write about this? What I did was to team up with a botanist and a zoologist and, what I will, uh, and a photographer uh, in order to put together the story that I will tell you now. In the year 1912, um, Lord Harding, who was then the Viceroy of British India, rode up a hill called Raisina Hill. Um, and from this height, he could look down on the old fort um, uh, built in the, um, 19, uh, in, in, the, in the 1300s. He could look at the medieval um, mosque, Jama Masjid, he could look at the Yamuna River, a silvery trickle in the distance. He looked at all of Delhi and his ruins laid out below him, and he said, what a splendid site for government house. Mm. And uh, what Lord Harding was talking about was the fact that the British government had decided to shift its capital, the, sh the capital of British India, from Calcutta to Delhi um, in, uh, in 1911. And they had set, uh, they instituted a committee, a town planning committee, to survey different sites which would be suitable for a new capital which would embody the power of uh, an empire on which the sun never sets. Um, the committee surveyed several sites in north and uh, south, what is now north and south Delhi. They eventually chose one because it had better drainage. It was cheaper to acquire land there. There was more land to build on a grand scale suitable for a truly imperial city signifying the power of the Raj. So ecology, economics, as well as imperial iconography were all at stake when it came to choosing the site of this, of what would eventually become New Delhi. Um, the site that they chose were the commons of Raisina village. Mm. And this was, a, uh, th this was undulating rocky land, quartzite rock, um, called Pahari. And this was classified in revenue uh, records as wasteland or Kohi land, a place of sh uh, stunted tr uh, trees and <coughs> shrubs grazed by sheep and goats, herded by boys from the Gujar or pastoralist caste. This area was then fenced off in 1913, and trees were planted in 1917-1918. Uh, but the trees kept dying because of the um, extreme heat and cold of this rocky terrain. Only one tree triumphed in this, um, in this area. 
And that was an import from Central America called Prosopis juliflora, uh, locally called Vilaiti kikar, or imported kikar. Mm -hmm. And uh, Prosopis juliflora is now um, a tree which has spread across a lot of India's wild lands. Yeah. It's regarded as an uh, alien invasive species. Uh, but at that time, it was regarded as a boon because it would allow you to green areas which had till then been uh, denuded of any kind of uh, any kind of vegetation. But Prosopis juliflora, because of this tax, uh, toxic alkaloid that it secretes from its root zone, um, actually crowded out uh, native trees because it would suppress the, their seedlings uh, from growing. Um, inside the present estate as well, um, which has large areas of wilderness, um, it is this tree, Prosopis juliflora, which dominates. Um, uh, which, which dominates. Much of the estate consists of wild areas like this, but the rest of it is, in fact, what you would expect, an extremely cultivated and ordered set of gardens. But I want to draw, dwell a little bit about the, on this contrast between the wilderness, which is also contained on the estate, and, this, and these gardens, to point out that it wasn't really a case, as many people tell the story, of imperial order establishing itself on native wildness, but both the wildness and the cultivated areas were both um, a result of imperial if, um, efforts to try and change um, the, the, the landscape um, in, in powerful ways. Raisina Hill itself was blasted. 20 feet of hard rock were removed to flatten the site. Water was pumped uphill all the way from the Jamuna River in order to create a 330-acre estate, uh, the house alone, the president's house, now called Rashtrapati Bhavan, um, covered five acres. There were 15 acres of gardens with water fountains, um, and uh, in all, an extremely large uh, residence, primarily for the uh, for, for one smallish family, the viceroy, his wife, and their children if they had any. Mm. So think about this in a country where um, people worked usually on what is called dobi ghazameen, mm. a tiny patch of an acre or two acres in order to make a living. So just the sheer scale of the estate, the fact that it's 330 acres, that is pleasure gardens alone take up 15 acres, um, was a form of conspicuous consumption. Mm -hmm. And what it pro proclaimed, this, uh, this profligacy in the use of land, was the preeminence of the British Raj uh, over India. Now, work on the gardens began in 1926. And here, the chief architect of New Delhi, the man with the pipe um, <laughs> to, the, to the right, that's Edward <laughs> Lutyens, collaborated with the man in the middle, uh, someone called Musto. Now, Musto was a gardener who um, started off uh, as a working class boy who got his job, a first job as an apprentice uh, in Kew Gardens in Richmond. And then he was sent to Lahore, an important uh, place <coughs> in the Raj, where um, he tried out new trees for roadside plantings. He, um, uh, it, it is said that he, in, he wrote a little monograph on uh, 300 species of Australian eucalypts that he tried out in India to see whether they would be suitable for avenue plantings or not. Um, uh, Edwin Lutyens, the architect, every uh, when he was in Delhi every winter building the new capital, would have breakfast with Musto. And together they then, um, after a lot of experimentation, came up with <coughs> planting schemes for all the avenues of New Delhi. Those of you who visited New Delhi know that it's stately avenues are made that much more grander because they have these beautiful uh, large canopy trees uh, alongside. Um, so all of these trees were, uh, were first tried out for hardiness and for their general aesthetic effect uh, by, 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 by Musto, or, and they were planted over 10 years from 1919 to 1929. And after this, Musto then turned to greening the Viceroy's estate and um, the debris from construction were removed. Um, new soil and manure was added. Uh, new plants, creepers were, um, were put in. And um, the forecourt and formal gardens were designed in order to impress visitors with their 
uh, empirical pomp. Um, the rest of the estate was then <coughs> meant to provide more domestic pleasures um, and, and comforts to the viceroy's family, but in the aristocratic style expected of their status. Um, the model on which the Rashtrapati Bhavan was, um, uh, was built was that of the English manor. Um, so there were eight tennis courts, there, were, there was a cricket field, a polo <laughs> ground, a swimming pool, and a nine-hole golf course. Um, if vis visitors wanted, they could go horse riding on the ridge, which is the wilderness area immediately to the west of the, of the mm -hmm. estate. There was a 16-acre kitchen garden, the Dali Khana, which provided fresh fruit, vegetables, and flowers. The garden staff numbered 418, of which 50 people were employed full-time to scare away birds with catapults. Uh, 20 <laughs> people were employed exclusively to make flower arrangements. So interestingly, such extravagance had in fact disappeared from British stately homes by this time. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it, they, it, it continued into, um, it, 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 the Raj continued these things in, uh, in India. I want to quickly talk about the gardens because they are interesting for bringing together two deeply sentimental styles of gardening. They're formal gardens, but what they do is bring together the uh, Mughal charbagh or the idea of an enclosed, uh, a cloistered garden, one which is um, bisected by, uh, uh, by, by water, by, by, by flows of, um, of fresh water, um, which has fruit trees and fragrant plants. And for Mughals who came um, out of, uh, you know, who were inspired by Persian ideals, um, an enclosed garden of water, fruit trees, and, and, and fragrant flowers was a way of, um, of, of um, reclaiming something from a very hostile, uh, arid environment. Um, this garden for the Mughals was a, a nostalgic statement about the kind of hilly terrain that they had come from, the fast rushing streams of the mountains uh, of Samarkand uh, that Babur, the first uh, Mughal ruler in India, remembered uh, with, with great nostalgia. The nostalgia of the Mughals for, uh, for the uh, gardens of the places where they, of the cooler places they came from, um, this ideal was complemented by another nostalgic <coughs> ideal, that of the English country garden where uh, uh, British planters who came to India, British uh, officials, uh, remembered with great uh, tenderness the beautiful flowers that, um, that they grew in uh, year round in England because of its uh, more milder climate and more perennial rain, but which in India they could grow only in a very short winter season, uh, the cooler months in, on, the, on the plains. Um, there was a flourishing trade in these kinds of plants, uh, the roses, the pansies, um, that they tried to grow, um, and also in grass seeds, because not only were these uh, were these plants of sentimental importance, they were also symbols of status. The power to have gardeners who would water your lawns um, all, all through the year to keep them green, uh, the power to command the labor to grow these tender little seedlings and make them and make them flower. Um, it's also, I should quickly note, a little ironic that many of the flowers that were so prized uh, by English um, settlers in India as symbols of Britain were actually flowers that had been collected by, uh, by, 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 by naturalists uh, from India. So the nasturtiums, the violets, um, the, um, also the, you know, the rhododendrons, the yeah. Uh, the geraniums, mm -hmm. many of them were collected from the Himalayan regions, mm -hmm. taken to Britain, and then um, cultivated, mm -hmm. and then brought back to India and, and taken to be symbols of, uh, of a British uh, identity. So uh, these are the sorts of iron uh, ironies of empire that gardening was, uh, was suffused with. Um, but looking at the time, I'm just going to move quickly along to um, talk about the kinds of just some images of the gardens, the uh, a pergola here. Um, mm -hmm. And from the avenues, um, the, 
Ashoka flower, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, shisham trees, that's Dalbergia sisu, um, uh, an ornamental import, Crescentia alata. Then this is a blister beetle on a Gruya flower. Um, these are uh, the striped pierrot butterflies on a bear, uh, bear trees, this is jujuba. You can see a, um, a crab spider holding a dead wasp. Um, oriental garden lizard. This is a buffed, uh, buff striped keelback snake. A brown headed barbet, a green pigeon. Um, something something I catch a compliment of the name. The pipe crested cuckoo. <laughs> and of course, India's oh. national bird. Um, uh, mongoose and jackals that we found or with our camera traps. Okay. Now it took 17 years to build this estate to. Um, to populate its gardens with flowers, uh, for all these creatures to come here and nest and um, and visit. 17 years to build the Viceroy's estate, but another 16 years and the empire over which it presided had vanished. Because by 1947, India was independent. And independence brought not only a new political regime, democracy, but also a new ethos to the place. And nothing actually shows the contrast between the ethos of the British Raj and the uh, and Indian uh, democracy and the first wave of nationalist rulers than this contrast between Lord Mountbatten, who was the last viceroy of, uh, of uh, British India, and the person in the middle here, who is um, someone called Rajaji, see Raja Gopalachari, India's mm -hmm. first governor general, who replaced Lord Mountbatten. Now, um, Mountbatten was the quintessential aristocrat. Queen Victoria was there at his christening. He loved the pomp of his uniform with its medals and, and so on and so forth. Rajaji, on, uh, on the other hand, was, uh, you know, wore a dhoti made of handspun, handwoven cloth. He was a, a son of a small town, um, of a small town legal official. And uh, he embodied Gandhian ideas of frugality and simplicity in how you wanted to live. And here he was living on this <coughs> gigantic, splendid estate. So mm -hmm. he said, I don't want to live in a palace. But India's first Prime Minister Nehru, in the photograph here with him, with Edina Mountbatten, Lord mm -hmm. Mountbatten's wife, and the vice, the vice Reen of India, uh, Nehru persuaded him, saying, you know, if you want to live in a smaller house, we'll actually have to you know, maintain both, and it's going to be more expensive. So why don't you live in this? Um, and here they are in the Mughal gardens of the present estate. So Rajaji did, but he moved into smaller quarters. The museum, uh, the, the uh, estate was also used as an archaeological museum up to the 1960, uh, until the National Museum was built. Um, but with the uh, coming of, with India becoming a republic in 1950, they were concerted efforts to try and make this estate a more democratic estate that reflected the new, uh, the new nation. Um, so the first prime president of India to live here, Raj, uh, Rajendra Babu, Rajendra Prasad, he said, you know, I feel I'm living in a zoo in this uh, and in a circus. Mm -hmm. um, but all of them then talked about the garden as a solace, a garden where they could enjoy the flowers. Um, subsequent presidents, most uh, notably um, Abdul Kalam, thought about how to make the grounds and gardens open to the public. Um, so they, they, they have now these, uh, these fountains, which um, are called dancing fountains because the water goes up and down to when patriotic tunes are played. <laughs> um, they also have a menagerie with, uh, with spotted deer and with the, the peacock and geese and ducks. Uh, they have a garden of medicinal plants. They also have a spiritual garden where plants that represent different religions, so the date palm for Islam, the Christmas tree for, <laughs> for Christianity, <laughs> um, and you know, the, the, the ficus, uh, the banyan tree for, uh, for Hinduism, the um, ficus religiosa, the people tree for Buddhism. All of these are put together in the same place. And as one of the gardeners said, if all these trees can grow together and live in harmony, why can't we? 
So um, th these are I ways in which uh, the, the gardens have been made mm -hmm. more accessible to people and to visitors who are allowed in for, for, for six weeks of the year. But they're also, if the gardens are also used for state occasions, for state receptions. And um, this is what some of the ceremonial life of the gardens uh, looks like. Oh my God. This is when they allow people in mm -hmm. and um, people visit the gardens in February, March, when they're opened after, uh, after Republic Day on uh, 26 January. And uh, the chief activity right now, uh, these days of course, is taking selfies. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to talk now briefly about what makes this estate, what makes these grounds and gardens possible. And that is the labor of people who work backstage. Mm -hmm. And for this, which is the most important garden in the country, um, the year turns around one date, which is 26th January. And that's when the gardens are open to the public. And every year there's a great deal of uncertainty about whether the garden's going to be ready on this particular date because the monsoons can be late. Delhi's smog more and more affects germination. You should get young seedlings from outside so that you, know, you can um, escape growing things in Delhi. You can't be sure if they will be the right color, the right height, and, and so on. So um, people prefer, the gardeners prefer to harvest their own seeds. But with the increasing uncertainty, uh, because of climate change, growing um, a, a number of flowers, for instance, to, uh, roses in Delhi is even harder than used to be the case. And this is a garden that was famous for, uh, for its roses. Now they generally import them for these kinds of flower arrangements from cities like, uh, like Bangalore. So what's happened is, given the uncertainties around gardening uh, in Delhi now, that uh, in most of the flower beds, the roses have been replaced by tulips. Mm. Tulips coming from the great floral industrial complex of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. That are flowers which have been programmed to flower punctually. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you stick them in the ground and um, they will come out. And the standard uh, sort of classic portrait of the president that's taken every year in previous years was always next to a rose bed full of you know beautiful fragrant blooms. Now, for the last 10 years, the president is always seen um, next, to, next to a bed of tulips because the roses don't, don't work anymore. <laughs> but even growing these tulips and all the other flowers uh, requires a great deal of manner, a great deal of hard work. Uh, as, the, as the gardeners say, uh, for 12 months, we are, our, our backs are bent. We don't get to stand up straight uh, at any time at all. Now, becoming a, a Mali or a gardener in the president's estate is um, unusual because most government uh, employed gardeners are moved around from place to place, but the people who work in the president's estate are, in not, are not transferred. In fact, far from leaving the estate, many of them were born on it since their fathers and often their grandfathers were employed as gardeners before them. Um, you know, somebody would put in a good word for you and you would get taken on. Now, this feudal system was one where uh, there was a kind of close-knit continuity between different, different generations with the older ones teaching the younger, right. uh, fathers and sons and cousins. Uh, not only kinship, but caste and village ties were also important. And many of the older gardeners come from the same uh, market uh, gardening communities, the Saini caste from Rajasthan. They said, we are artisans. We are artists of, uh, of the hand. Our craft lies in our hands. And gardening lore is actually passed on by watching and doing. Uh, what you need is a keen eye and constant practice to hone the skills required to nurture plants. <coughs> you have to know which seeds need what conditions. You have to know how to press down the soil gently when replanting a seedling. You have to optimize the changing conditions, the calculus of sun and shade and food and water. You have to know when to prune and harvest, how to diagnose an ailing plant and nurse it back to health. No training course or book tells you this. Only actually doing it with your hands, only apprenticeship, is how these skills get passed on. Now, the problem with um, this mode of passing on knowledge and continuing to maintain these gardens is that um, most of the permanent employees, most of the gardeners in this, um, in this 
uh, in this place are in their 40s and older, and no one has been recruited for 20 years. This is common with a lot of other government departments where there's a tendency now <coughs> to close down uh, permanent jobs, take on people on, on short-term contracts. Um, mm. Hiring workers on contract makes it hard to transfer the skills of gardeners from one generation to the next. Um, gardening knowledge that's acquired and passed on in long-term hands-on relationships is lost because the temporary gardeners don't stick around long enough to learn from the senior staff. And then the senior staff aren't motivated to teach those who might not be around the next year. Mm. So the temporary gardeners are relegated to doing the most uh, basic jobs and the heavy lifting. And the specialized skills acquired by working on the same task for years, making bonsai, um, are difficult to, uh, for instance, are difficult to teach under such conditions. So there's been a gradual tapering off of generations of workers who have a deep familiarity with and an affinity for the present estate. Mm -hmm. Those who know the distinctive features of each tree and flower bed, as well as a larger sum of the landscape. So this steady shrinking of permanent jobs in the Indian government um, in the last two decades, especially at the lower levels, um, is, is a you know, quite common story. But this has specific implications for gardening, as indeed for any vocation that requires sustained engagement with one's work. Um, it's very <coughs> teaching that excellence uh, demands years of dedicated practice, the opportunity to learn and reflect, try out new things, mm. and most of all, to care about one's work and to take pride in it. Only permanent jobs allow for these enabling conditions. When gardeners come and go, or are recruited from the ranks of so-called unskilled labor, that is, daily wage, uh, daily wage workers on contract, gardens become poorer. And in India, where any manual work is looked down upon, and caste is because caste is so deeply ingrained in our minds, um, this is, gardening is not seen as a skilled, uh, as skilled work at all. It's just seen as something which anybody can <coughs> come in and, and do. And yet it is this um, unremitting work that is done, has to be done every single day of the year that creates both beauty as well as, um, as, well as life. So in conclusion, gardening is a way of writing upon the earth Mm -hmm. Writing in a language that is at once a deeply personalized, embodied act and part of a shared cultural world. And this earth writing addresses a specific place, the city of Delhi with its ecology, the estate with its uh, colonial, imperial and uh, nationalist um, heritage. But it is also informed by other places connected by the crisscrossing of imperial, commercial and other cultural flows. People and plants have traveled and settled, struggled and conquered, partnered and parted ways. Reading these intertwined lives and landscapes is the first step in writing a new future for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have uh, ample time for questions. Uh, let me tell you your questions. Yeah, sure. Yes. Thank you so much for your talk, I really enjoyed it. Um, I know several of us in this room read um, Chandra Mukherjee's book on Versailles, and I was sort of mm -hmm. thinking of that as you were speaking. Um, you sort of ended near there, near the end on a, sort of maybe tensions between sort of austerity and the kind of labor and temporalities of both, I guess, the environment and possibly the state. Um, and I, I couldn't help but sort of think of parallels with conversations that I had with U.S. Forest Service agents in you know, our context um, of Idaho and also given California wildfires. I was wondering, have you, have you grappled at all with questions of sort of temporality or scale? Or you mentioned labor, of course, but uh, does that come into your work as well? Uh, wh what do you mean by temporality in this case? Well, thinking of the sort of time scales at which like the state might function versus the sort of economic view towards thinking of austerity as a, a particular economic project of the state, um, but also the sort of growing seasons of plants and things like that that require that day-to-day -day and long-term investment. Yeah. Um, hmm. I have to think a bit more about that. But you know, off the cuff, I'd say that uh, because this is such a prestigious place, mm -hmm. uh, there's a way in which there's an attempt to hold austerity at bay. 
and to keep this in some ways a place of exception um, where other kinds of government rules mm. don't apply. Mm. So for instance, the fact that uh, this has a staff that's not moved around, unlike the other uh, gardeners who work with the Central Public Works Department who move from place to place. Um, but the fact that there is, that there has been a concerted effort to just, um, you know, bear down the uh, establishment costs of labor is something which has, in fact, made its uh, uh, made its uh, its way into uh, onto this particular um, estate as well. So there is a kind of tension here between um, austerity, but also trying to you know sort of insulate this uh, this from that. Uh, from uh, from the from, from what's overall going on uh, within uh, the government, I'd like to actually think of the temporality issue as uh, a particularly vexed one in this context because um, th there is a way in which you know this heritage that is the president's estate. It's a it's a heritage which is used, uh, but at the same time, people are mindful of uh, the fact that this is a colonial. Um, monumental heritage that is uh, being in inhabited here um, creates a, a, a great degree of tension because on the one hand there is a sense of we must preserve it as it is we must or you know honor Latins's vision um, at the same time there is a sense that you know this was a colonial enterprise and um, you know this needs to be modified given that we're a democratic nation so um, these are questions which are not articulated clearly enough because I think, by and large, Indian, um, in, you know, the uh, Indian attitude towards recent history is one of, you know, we really don't want to deal with it, uh, with explicitly, with it explicitly. Let's just sort of carry on. Um, you know, I think there's there's a certain lack of distance, uh, even though it's been, you know, we would think a hundred years enough time to. You know, try and have a conversation about what this heritage represents, mm -hmm. and you know how we need to modify it. Mm -hmm. um, but so a lot of it is just that kind of institutional. You know, perhaps it's the inertia that sometimes exists in all institutions that you know we just keep things ticking over. Uh, but now I think questions are being asked. For instance, why, given that you know Delhi has a perennial problem with water scarcity. Mm -hmm. Should you maintain a golf course and should you maintain these lawns? Suppose you replace the lawns with native species of grasses which are uh, you know, more drought proof. Um, so there's now a conversation at least among ecologists uh, who are asking questions of the way in which the, um, the physical landscape, uh, especially the cultivated part, is, is maintained. Uh, but this is, these are just uh, conversations which are starting off. They haven't yet shaped what's actually happening there on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, Sumati, um, um, Paula, Adam, Deepa. Well, my question, I think, you know, it's already sort of been answered. I had a question about water, but actually it was also very interesting in your response, you know, the irony, right, of this the view from the rice in a hill mm -hmm. that the colonials had, which is, you know, the typical colonial, right, view from the promontory where you mm -hmm. can see everything. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, because of Delhi smog, anybody who stands on the hill, the city disappears. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we know this, right, during beating the retreat. You can't even see anything, yeah. right? So yeah. there is a metaphor there for what's happening with this colonial yeah. monument, yeah. right? So yeah. even if there's inertia, the climate may provide, you know, some answer. Yeah. But yeah. Jokes aside, I was really curious about how much water do you think is being consumed by this estate, given yeah. Delhi's perennial water crisis? Mm. Yeah. Do we have figures on this? Yeah. Uh, so quickly, um, yes, we do. And they, uh, you know, while while I was doing this this work, uh, the the course of this uh, the course of this uh, you know year long project. Uh, they actually put in um, new, most of their water is uh, is from bore wells. They're mm -hmm. picking up groundwater. Um, a lot of it is untreated for the garden, for gardening purposes. Yeah. Um, the water that, the pipe water that is used on the president's, in, in the palace and in the uh, in the officer's quarters, etc., is now recycled on site. Okay. And it's, it's again used for, uh, they have a new sewage treatment plant and oh. they, they're using it. 
So um, before that, when President uh, Narayanan was, um, was, was living there, he had uh, this NGO, Center for Science and Environment, put in a water harvesting system. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's mainly fallen into disuse. What happens is that every president has a pet project, right. which they institute, improve the grounds. And once the president's tenure is over, the project immediately, you know, people just lose interest, stop spending money, stop maintaining it. So unfortunately, the water harvesting system doesn't work. But last time I checked, the sewage treatment plant was working. Mm -hmm. But to your first point about you know the sort of uh, the gaze, yeah. the colonial gaze, and what's happened yeah. to it. Yeah. As you, you you probably know the story about the reason why you can't actually see the president's palace or what was then the viceroy's right. palace from the foot of Rice Hill right. is right. Be is because there was a mistake. Yeah. So what was supposed to be towering above because of uh, Herbert Baker, the architect who worked together with uh, Edwin Lutyens, um, they you know there was a there was a mistake. So they had thought. Latins had imagined the, uh, the Viceroy's Palace as towering above the mm -hmm. old city of um, medieval city of Shah Janabad, the rest of Delhi, and so on. But because of Herbert uh, Baker's mistake, um, the palace actually sort of slid out of view. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So what you look up to yeah. is just this the brow of the hill, right. and you can't see the palace because no. it's 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 down below. Oh, yeah. So yeah. you know, it's even for the hill. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, like the yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's nice to think of you know these <laughs> these architects with their grand yeah. visions, and you know, yeah. there's a certain sort of geometry box precision to the circles and straight lines, and you know, the avenues that bisect all of New Delhi. And so Latians has this wonderful mathematical, you know, design for the city which is so grand, yeah. and yet they make a mistake like that, and this palace just sort of pops <laughs> out of sight. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, thank it's you great. so much. That was brilliant, as always, and uh, you know, just very exciting. And I w my question is around, a little bit around temporality, but very much around the trees under which nothing is able to grow, like not only Keep eucalyptus, that. but the others. Yeah. And um, it, you know, it's interesting in light of this wood wide web uh, research that's being done now about how trees communicate with each other, yeah. etc. Yeah. Um, and there, we ha there's the imposition of foreign trees that are taking up water, that are not communicating with anyone else. And I was curious as to how uh, much, like, how much land does that occupy in relation, like, percentage-wise, these. Or is it the entire estate, or is it just part of it? Um, and uh, basically, what uh, you know, just the percentage of it. And I was also interested in, like, just reading the symbolics of that. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to um, find this map of the estate, which shows you the area which is under uh, a kind of wilderness, but. Um, a wilderness which is dominated. Um, so the, you know, the you can see that the there's yeah. the tree-covered grounds. This one. Oh, is that um, and but this is the jungle. Ah, so right. the jungle part is what uh, is dominated by the Prosopis juniflora, oh. the, by the Vilaiti kikar. Yeah. But also the eucalyptus you were, you were mentioning, which. They, they tried out eucalyptus, and there are some uh, very old lemon-scented gum trees, uh, but they, they were planted only in, on, in, in, on one particular s in, uh, section of the estate right. as avenue trees. So the eucalypts haven't been a problem. They were planted you know, in, uh, singly as, as ornamentals. Uh, what really went wild mm -hmm. and naturalized to the point where it's you know, dominant and monopolizing the landscape is um, the Prosopis uh, juliflora. And the um, thing is that it's a great survivor. It's the only yeah. thing that will grow in uh, large parts of the country. Um, but the, the problem has been that these were often grasslands, which yeah. were not meant to have trees at yeah. all. So if you think of the great grasslands of the Badni in Kutch, yeah. um, you know, where there's salty soil, yeah. um, they deliberately planted Prosopis juliflora because they regard grasslands 
um, as wastelands. Right. Uh, and so yeah. there's a tendency to um, you know privilege treed landscapes mm -hmm. over grasslands, over deserts. I mean, mm -hmm. people think deserts are right. dead places. I mean, yeah. that's that's not true. Yeah. But um, because this was a tree that flourished in all kinds of very <coughs> adverse uh, and extreme uh, in environments. Um, you know, the, the former Maharaja of Jodhpur in, um, in Rajasthan, he actually flew a plane scattering seeds of Prosopis juliflora uh, into the desert. And uh, it is, it's a menace in the desert today, because uh, not only because it takes up, uh, takes up a lot of uh, water, because its roots <coughs> go really deep, but uh, primarily because it, it outcompetes any native uh, vegetation mm -hmm. and does so because of these uh, toxic alkaloids it puts, it puts down in, into the soil. Mm -hmm. um, removing it is very hard, um, again, because it's just so tenacious and the roots go so deep. Um, but there's been a lot of work on trying to you know, yeah. eliminate it, yeah. uh, but not, it's, it's not ha made ma my major impact on the ground yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Adam? Thank you. Um, Thank you, first of all. Yeah. I'm curious about the, so the position of the Mali. Yeah. Obviously, in, in the Shpatibadan, the Mali becomes something of a, that's a heritage position that I'm guessing is also better paid than your average Mali scattered across Delhi. I'm wondering how that, or how you see the idea of the Mali moving elsewhere. I mean, I know you've done other work on other gardens in Delhi, and other gardens require it, but I'm thinking also the new giant sort of gated communities in Noida and Greater Noida where this kind of colonial imperial, it's not traditional ecological knowledge, it's almost a colonial ecological knowledge, reappears through the potted plant gardens that grace, you know, that window of time in February in front of all the, the gates. I'm, I'm wondering how that, if, if Mali's are revalued in some sense, or if it remains a, or if it's rather an inscription of, as you gestured, caste and, and class, demanding service but not valuing that service. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're right, they are valued to some extent, in the sense that they are valued as providing a service um, because they are, you know, growing flowers and so on. Um, and yet it's not regarded as a as a skill which, you know, wh which is respected. I mean, as you know, any uh, work that I involves working with one's hands in India um, is something which is looked down upon. And something like this, which is actually hard physical work, you actually get your hands dirty, is especially disdained. Mm -hmm. So uh, they continue to be jobs for Malis. Um, Mali is, is the word Mali means gardener, um, but the, but you know it's not treated as um, something which would be a respectable profession. Mm -hmm. All the Malis of the Rashtrapati Bhavan that I spoke to, um, when I asked them what their children were doing, they said, "Oh, my son's studying medicine. Another one's doing an MBA, mm -hmm. etc., etc." Not one of them said that their children were, or their sons especially were, um, had wanted to be gardeners themselves mm -hmm. or had done professional courses in gardening. They saw these jobs as, um, you know, permanent jobs which gave them a good income which allowed them to live on the estate, but as jobs which then gave them the resources to <coughs> be able to make sure that their children did something else. Mm -hmm. um, this is a great talk, thank you. It's yes. a really productive. Uh, just a few things. What was interesting is I was thinking about Musto and the Mali, right? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, like looking at the history of Elizabethan gardens, you realize that it's working class gardeners, right? The history of British gardens are working class gardeners, they're Malis, right? But you have a discrepancy between Musto the Mali, who produced this garden, and the Malis whose labor is enabling the continuity, and that's a place where the colonial trajectory bro breaks down, right? So, I mean, it would be, it would be interesting to, to sort of ask that question of the estate itself, right? Yeah. So, you know, it'd be really interesting, because you don't get a, a gardens in the great garden period, the Elizabethan period onwards, 
without working class Malis. Yeah. Like they do the design, they do the labor, they do everything. Yeah. And the yeah. great gardens in England still run with working class folk, yeah. right? Yeah. Hands. That is very interesting. In fact, usually if I if I were to give this talk in India, yeah. I would say Musto was a Mali. Yeah. And that always, you know, sort stops, of stops people because yeah. you say he's a white guy. How can he be a Mali? Mali. Um, but yes, Musto was a Mali. Yeah. He came from a, you know, a family that, you know, that his father used to work on some sort of, you know, great house yeah. uh, as a gardener. So yeah. he grew up as a, you know, from childhood onwards, laboring on a, on a mansion. And yeah. then, you know, he gets to work on another mansion later in life. Um, but how he's treated in India and yeah. what he becomes is, um, I mean, there are two things going on, right? One is, of course, race. Yeah. But the other is Q as an institution yeah. in mediating this transition. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's because it's in Q that he moves from being, you know, a common, whatever, common or garden gardener yeah. to being uh, somebody who an is expert, who's an expert. Yeah. yeah. So is it, would he be called a horticulturist then? Yes, that's yeah. what he is. So, so in fact, he becomes a garden. He shifted. And, and, and therefore, culture, his, right? uh, therefore yeah. his first, his, his first sent abroad to, yeah. uh, you know, so he sent from Q to India uh, to become director of horticulture in Lahore. Yeah. Yeah. And so then yeah. that's that's yeah. when yeah. He's, he's translated. Yeah. yeah. And then he uh, yeah. he writes a monograph, mm -hmm. and yeah. that's you know about roadside avenues. So then yeah. he's becoming. Yeah, he's, he's become a different kind of you know, of expert. Yeah. Yeah. But mind you, he was really hands-on. So there are yeah. stories written by his contemporaries about how he would um, go yeah. on to this, you know, the jungle part, and he would personally tuck seedlings of Prosopis juliflora into crevices in the rock. Mm. Mm. Um, and you know, he would, so there's a description by a man called Parker that he and Musto would drive off every Sunday morning in their Jeep and Musto would have a little sling bag in which he would have his tools, and uh, he would have this, these, uh, you know, this, uh, seeds of Prosopis juliflora, and he'd go in and plant each one. This plant that's now a menace. But there's also stories of how the early rose plantings in the president's estate, uh, you know, there was there was one year a particularly severe winter with a bad frost, and uh, Musto woke up in the middle of the night and was in tears because you know his car broke down or wouldn't start or something. And he had to go and hose off the plants to make sure that uh, the thawing didn't. Yeah, exactly. They didn't. Yeah. They didn't freeze. Um, so he and you know the, he said the Indian Malis were just standing around and I had to do it. So mm. he was still. Um, he wasn't just a big sahib who told people yeah. what to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was very hands on. Yeah. But his hands on ness was has a different status because of race. Yeah. 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 So yeah. can I ask another quick question? And it's about earth. Right, so I think, and to go back to uh, Paula's thing about talking, mm -hmm. I was actually involved with um, somebody who's uh, a group that's reworking the Western Ghats uh, near uh, Pune, and just thinking about like the way in which communication occurs. And so I was thinking about the, what you started with, which is the blasting and then the reinvesting with soil and card. And the thing about a lot of the communication between plants is through other things. Right. So I was just thinking, like, is there, because that's something that is an environmental conversation in, in South Asia, right, which is, and it's part of your pictures, mm -hmm. is literally what's living in the soil and what literally that kind of earth, the way in which it made a different ecosystem in this space, including an ecosystem in the, in the, in the jungle part. So just you know, and then they, you constantly bring card, you make card. I mean, the point is you want animated card, yeah. right? Not dry sand. Yeah. So what's the, you know, how to think about the question of animated earth? Yeah. Because I know you think about this sort of stuff, so. Yeah, I just want to pull up that picture of the women making yes. the... Yeah, I was yeah, thinking the about the labor of it. Yeah. And then if you yeah. hand yeah. it over to the... Is that what it was? No, they, they're actually sitting leaf manure, oh, yeah. which they're going to then add to the vermicompost and making yeah. it a different part and of it. And it's the all alive. It's really alive. Uh, yeah. The state. Yeah. yeah. And so that gets handed over to the temporary people. Then you've actually killed the life of the earth. Mm. Right? So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. I mean, I need to yeah. think a bit more about that. Because, as I said, this is your work, and so it'll be interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're right there. So we just passed it. Two, two yeah. Oh, 
Well, you can go to the yeah. side and actually that's it. To that's the one. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. what they're doing. Okay. And yeah. it's with wide breaks, so it allows everything to live in the middle. Right? That's the thing you have yeah. to make. The rake ties have to be proper. That's uh -huh. right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Amita, thank you very much. This is great.